All right, we're going to wrap up the lecture on humeral shaft fracture management uh, by getting into some complications. Again, this is the uh, third part of the uh, lecture from the Orthopedic Trauma Association uh, Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 3 uh, by Greg Della Rocca. I'm Saka Brahman narrating uh, this PowerPoint. Um, and we already covered indications, anatomy, uh, surgical approaches, and um, in the last set of slides we kind of went into uh, the surgical techniques for plating, uh, for intramedullary nailing, and a little bit about external fixation as well. Um, so we're going to wrap things up now by just getting into complications. Um, so. Uh, some of the big ones, um, particular to the humeral uh, shaft, are the radial nerve. Okay, I think that's obviously the unique uh, issue uh, when dealing with these fractures and managing them. And of course, this is a potential complication of uh, the injury as well as uh, surgical management. Uh, vascular injury is another one, and uh, non-union. So, uh, radial injury uh, uh, has an incidence of 1.8 to 24%. Um, primary radial nerve injury, essentially patient comes in with a wrist drop uh, and the uh, injury is presumed to be uh, in, in the, including the fracture and the uh, nerve injury at the same time. Uh, Where a secondary nerve injury occurs later, either during closed treatment or open management. Uh, and um, the, the management is somewhat controversial. Um, transverse fractures in the middle third are most commonly associated with neuropraxia. Um, unless it's open, you rarely have some type of laceration uh, in those injuries. Spiral fractures are the so-called uh, Holstein-Lewis fracture of the distal third. Have a little bit of a higher risk for laceration or entrapment of the radial nerve. But again, it's the open fractures that tend to have more physical damage uh, that you can see uh, to the radial nerve than closed fractures. So spontaneous recovery of nerve function is found in over 70% of cases, even in secondary palsies. Uh, those with, uh, you know, that when you get, manipulate the fracture and they go out, they have a high rate of spontaneous recovery. And by three to four months, uh, most will resolve. Not all, but most will resolve. And, uh, you know, if it's um, some time has passed and you want to sort of get a sense of the prognosis, then EMG and nerve conduction studies can sometimes give you an idea uh, the level of the injury and uh, the, the likelihood and prognosis for recovery. So three most frequently stated indications for immediate surgical management uh, for fractures with radial nerve palsy are open fractures, okay, because in these cases, again, you're more likely to have a physical nerve laceration or, or injury to the nerve transection or something. Holstein-Lewis fractures where you can sometimes get entrapped and people do get uncomfortable with secondary palsies developing after a closed reduction. So they came in, they were intact, and you do a closed reduction and now they're not intact. So um, pretty much the only one I think you can be very confident about for, uh, for exploration are palsies associated with open fractures. Uh, it's the only one that's really not associated with conflicting data. But for secondary palsies, it's not clearly established that surgery is going to improve the ultimate recovery rate compared to non-surgical management. So, I mean, so many surgeons say, if you have a palsy that uh, that develops, or you know, patient comes in and has radial nerve palsy, it's a closed injury, um, that um, you can treat them. Especially if you can treat them, if you treat them closed and you're not planning to do surgery, that you can treat them closed and the nerve's usually going going to recover. Um, some surgeons disagree with that. Um, uh, again, if it's if it's open with a primary palsy, uh, open fracture exploration is indicated. Um, and in this uh, uh, particular review by Dr. Hawk, uh, 714 cases of primary and 130 secondary palsies uh, all observed initially. There's really no difference in recovery rates uh, after um, closed management uh, uh, and not having to explore the nerve. The other thing is early exploration can risk additional injury to the nerve if it's only a contusion. So, um, so non-surgical fracture management uh, is, is indicated uh, initially 
um, and you typically don't have to explore the nerve. Um, so what are the advantages of late versus early nerve exploration? Well, um, uh, if you uh, wait, well then the, uh, you know, uh, enough, enough time maybe he'll, he'll have passed to recover from neuropraxia ternartmesis. Um, the uh, fracture may have united by that point and um, and often the results of secondary repair can be as good as, as primary repair for a mixed nerve like this. So what about vascular injury? Well, although uncommon, this can occur. Uh, oftentimes it can be from some type of penetrating injury, uh, possibly vessel entrapment by fracture fragments, although that's relatively uncommon, but it, it can happen. Um, and sometimes uh, you can get thrombosis after swelling in a tight compartment. Um, the uh, brachial artery has the greatest risk of injury in the proximal third and uh, distal third of the arm. Um, you know, getting arteriography uh, with, with these injuries is, is controversial. It, it's, you know, if you have an ischemic limb, sometimes you just have to get the patient to, to the operating room. Um, as is the case uh, with most vascular injuries, you want to emergently reestablish arterial inflow. Uh, and then you want to provide some type of fracture stabilization. And, and you know, this could be a case where you, uh, you're right there, you visualize everything, you plate the fracture. Um, or if it's a um, sort of ugly open injury, uh, external fixation could be an option. And, you know, the steps of which you do first is a bit controversial. I mean, I think my, my take on this is, um, is that... Um, there has to be just high level uh, input uh, with an attending vascular surgeon and attending orthopedic surgeon to make a decision uh, how to best perfuse the limbs since that comes first. Uh, and if the vascular surgeon feels that um, they really need to have the limbs stabilized for them to do an appropriate vascular repair, then you stabilize it. Whereas if they think that they have to get that done as quickly as possible and are willing to take their chances with the manipulation that occurs with the vascular repair, then um, then they would uh, do that first. And, and, and in many cases, you can do a temporary a temporary uh, shunting, for instance, to reestablish flow and then fix it and then come back and do a formal repair. Now, what about non-unions? Well, uh, unfortunately, non-unions can occur. Um, they're not that common, but 0 to 15 percent. And proximal and distal ones are at more risk. Um, gaps such as this, for instance, um, secondary to distraction or soft tissue interposition uh, are um, probably the biggest risk factors. But um, other risks are uncontrolled fact, uh, fracture motion, uh, an impaired soft tissue envelope and blood supply, or unfortunately infection. Um, these are a little bit more likely with transverse fracture pattern like you see here with some gapping, older age, poor nutritional status, uh, and uh, multiple other um, systemic, um, systemic problems as well as you know, open fracture. So with a non-union, you want to try to get bone stability. You want to eliminate a gap and compress it. Um, you may need to uh, restore osseous vascularity, do autogenous bone grafting. Of course, if there's any infection, you need to eliminate the infection as well. Uh, typically, um, compression plating or some type of plate fixation is the treatment of choice for most non-unions. Um, IM fixation has been less successful. And like with most non-unions, some type of biologic stimulation, uh, stimulation for any atrophic or oligotrophic um, non-unions with drilling or shingling of the cortex where you try to stimulate some fracture, uh, some bone bleeding, and uh, autograft are important adjuncts, you know, especially for the atrophic types. Um, so... You know, when you have a non-union, there's going to be a lot of scar tissue, so you may have to make sure that you remove all the pathologic and scar tissue. Um, and uh, if you have an infection, there's potentially going to be infected tissue as well. So you have to do even more debridement uh, with an infected non-union. 
Uh, these cases may end up with dead space, and even without dead space, they may benefit from antibiotic bead placement to, to get high doses of antibiotics there. Um, if they need stabilization and uh, it's not appropriate for internal fixation initially, then you may have to do provisional X-fix. Uh, and then uh, once the infection has uh, been defined and controlled, then uh, definitive management uh, could require additional bone graft and internal fixation. Now, uh, more complicated uh, cases uh, are those that involve uh, bone loss, uh, synovial cavities, cases like this where there's prior surgical uh, treatment that's failed. And these may require more elaborate reconstructive efforts, vascularized fibular transfers, um, fibular, uh, vascularized fibular grafts, uh, Ilizarov techniques potentially. Um, and we won't get too much into, into all of that. Um, here's a case of an infected non-union initially treated with radical debridement, insertion of antibiotic beads. Uh, once the infection was under control, this was treated with a plate fixation and um, eventually healed, uh, you know, and had needed autografting as well. All right, so um, that wraps it up. Again, uh, this was the... Uh, Orthopedic Trauma Association um, resident lecture series um, uh, narrating this and um, this is the conclusion of the humeral shaft fracture um, lecture. Thank you very much.